of you. Welcome to the fourth webinar of the series SciTalk, organized by the Botanical Society of the University of Colombo. Majority of the participants here are familiar of this program and majority are part of POTSOC. But for those who, who joined with us for the first time, the Botanical Society of University of Colombo, also known as BOTSOC, is an active student body of the, the University of Colombo, affiliated to the Department of Plant Sciences of the Faculty of Science. Since its inception in 1960s, BOTSOC has organized several projects to promote awareness and interest in plant sciences while creating a platform for its members to strengthen their soft skills. With the transition of university activities to online learning, Botsock organized this series of webinars by the name SciTalks to create a platform for sharing knowledge and experience of our very own alumni who are currently working abroad to inspire the current undergraduates. So today we have with us Dr. Lakshmi Artigada, a proud product of the Department of Plant Sciences, University of Colombo, to talk about the evolutionary story of Sri Lankan temperate bamboo. Dr. Artigala graduated with a special degree in plant sciences in the year 2007 and was the recipient of the Professor Abbe Vikrama Award for plant sciences in that year. She was also a former treasurer of Botsa. Dr. Artigala worked as a demonstrator and an assistant lecturer at the department and later as a research assistant to Professor Anmada. She completed her PhD on understanding deeper phylogenetic relationships within temperate woody bamboos, emphasizing the Sri Lankan native temperate woody bamboos under the supervision of Dr. Clark of Iowa State University, USA and Dr. Katri Arachi. Afterwards, she conducted her postdoc research and joined the Iowa State University as a research scientist. Currently, she serves not only as a research scientist, but also as the lab manager of Chernobyl Lab, facility manager of Genomic Technologies Facility, operational manager of the Plant Sciences Institute, and the academic advisor to the Sri Lankan Student Association at Iowa State University, USA. Dr. Artigala, thank you for accepting our invitation and we are honored to have you with us today. Before moving on, I would like to uh, kindly request the participants to uh, unmute yourselves, uh, to mute yourself during the uh, presentation to uh, avoid any interruptions. Your question. Come, we will make you uh, So, shall we start? Hello? I mean, it's hard. You were breaking a little bit. I couldn't hear everything uh, you said. Sorry. sorry. Yeah. Are you okay to start the presentation? Yes, yes. Can I share my screen? Yes. To start with, let me ask my first question to you. Why did you select this topic and what is its significance? So thank you, Vivini, for that really nice introduction. And I would also like to thank Dr. Katri Arachi and then also Dr. Nana Kara for inviting me. I'm really excited to share some of my 
research work with you all today. And I'm excited that we have lots of young uh, future scientists that who are joining me today. So um, I hope you find this uh, research stuff interesting. Uh, so with that, uh, moving on to Uine's question, why I selected uh, this topic to discuss with you all today is, um, first of all, it's uh, just this audience. Uh, I think uh, for many of you, these are not strange plants. You've seen this before. So uh, I thought it is, you guys are an, uh, an um, excellent audience to discuss some of my Sri Lankan uh, research, the research that's related to Sri Lanka with you all. And the second uh, being, uh, these are some of the understudied plants when I started my PhD. So um, I thought this is something that I have to uh, pass on my knowledge to some of the uh, you know, Sri, Sri Lankan audience. Uh, the third uh, reason being, uh, this is uh, one of my very favorite plants. So um, I am excited to share my research with you all today. So uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, what bamboos are. Uh, some of you might know that bamboos are grasses. They are in family Poaceae. Uh, Poaceae is one of the, uh, one of the largest uh, families in the plant kingdom. Um, and subfamily Bambusoidae is one of the 12 subfamilies within grass uh, family. And also, uh, unlike the other grasses, uh, bamboos are the only grass lineage that diversified into the forest. Uh, unlike uh, some of these other grasses that you see in open grasslands and um, in open areas, you see uh, bamboos as understories uh, of forests. Uh, so then uh, moving on to the ecological importance of uh, bamboos. Um, these, are, um, uh, for, for, these are a major component of um, forest ecosystems. Uh, they, as I said, they grow as uh, an understory and also uh, they uh, help protect and then regenerate forest ecosystems. If you take bamboos as in general, they are a, an ecosystem itself. Um, I think for many of uh, us, if we uh, think about bamboos, the very first thing I think that comes to your mind um, is pandas. Red pandas and then also uh, pandas uh, in general, they, they have a huge relationship with uh, bamboos. So their uh, survival depends on bamboos. However, there's a huge, uh, you know, other diversity of um, animals associated with these uh, plants as well. Uh, not only pandas, uh, many other animals like monkeys, gorillas, uh, different bird species, not just for their um, uh, feeding, but also as their breeding grounds and sometimes their hiding grounds, they use uh, these bamboo, uh, different bamboo species, and sometimes they use uh, bamboo uh, forest. Um, and also um, some of these uh, species, I think those are very familiar to uh, some of uh, you all, uh, like these samba deers that you find in um, uh, in, in Horton Plains, uh, they, they, they are part of their major diet come from uh, bamboos. And also not only just these uh, big animals, but also uh, small uh, animals and then also insects, um, amphibians, uh, fungi, they all associate with uh, bamboos as well. So this is just a small uh, part of uh, the ecological importance of bamboos. Uh, and also, mm -hmm. Uh, you, you, many of you should know that um, bamboo has a huge ecological importance as well. Uh, they are fast growing, uh, they're renewable, and then also um, they are easy to grow because of all these reasons. Uh, people around the world use bamboos for many different purposes, uh, including construction and then flooring, fencing, and some parts of the world um, entirely rely on bamboos for their day-to-day -day transportation. And we know even in Sri Lanka, we have lots of kitchen utensils and all these other types of uh, instruments. Those were made out of bamboos. And there, there's a huge uh, a, 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 a new market uh, developed with some of these newer products like bamboo tea and bamboo beverages like beer. And, and I think many of you know that bamboo shoots are an um, a, an important uh, component in Chinese uh, cuisine and also uh, bamboo extracts are used in uh, many different types of medicines now. Um, 
bamboo charcoal is uh, being used as fuel and also um, bamboo paper and, and fabric are getting um, lots of attention these days as well, especially the bamboo fiber. They've been used at, in uh, different types of fabrics because of its uh, breathable quality and they, they are getting lots of attention these days as well. Uh, not only ecology and economy, but also uh, there's a huge cultural uh, associations with bamboos as well. If you look at some of the um, historical Chinese literature, you can see that bamboos go hand in hand with the culture and lots of Asian cultures. So uh, lots of ecological importance, economy, and then also culture all associated with bamboos as well. So then a little bit about uh, bambusoidae in general major lineages of bambusoidae. Uh, there are three major lineages, or we can call them as tribes. Bambusiae, uh, those are the tropical woody bamboos. And Olairiae, those are herbaceous bamboos. And Arundinariae, which is the temperate woody bamboo clade. Tropical woody bamboos are um, mainly distributed in neotropics and then also uh, paleotropics. And Olairiae are mostly in the uh, Southern America and a temperate clade, uh, mostly in some parts of the United States, in Central Africa and Madagascar, uh, Sri Lanka, India, and then also um, these uh, Southeast uh, Asian parts of the world. Um, so there are about 1,700 species described so far within uh, the subfamily Bambusoidae. And these are some of the defining characters of uh, bamboos. Um, woody habit is one of the major uh, feature of uh, bambusoidae, um, uh, even though there are some herbaceous uh, groups in this, uh, in this clade as well. Uh, calm leaves is another feature. Calm leaves is, um, is a special type of a leaf um, that we call the stem of the bamboo as a calm. And th there's a sheet that goes around it with a leaf blade. That's what is called as calm leaves. That is a unique feature of bambusoidae as well. Um, and we, they have lots of complex uh, branching and gregarious monocarpy, which means they, they have one reproductive cycle. So they start um, you know, flowering, they produce seeds and they die. Uh, some species, um, their reproductive cycles ranges from a um, you know, few years to sometimes 120 years. So those are some of the morphological features that you can see. And that's how you recognize a bamboo um, as a bamboo. Uh, and also uh, these are another special uh, type of a cell called invaginated, uh, asymmetrically um, invaginated arm cells. This you will see when you take a cross section or a longitudinal section of a leaf. So this is um, related to anatomy, but that's also um, unique to bambusoidae as well. Um, then, uh, as I said, uh, my focus today is going to be uh, this temperate woody bamboo clade, Arundinariae. Um, and I would also uh, like to tell you a little bit about this group, because this is the group that we are going to be talking about a lot in the coming few slides. Uh, there are about 580 species so far described in the temperate clade. Uh, some of the major defining characters of this clade are um, they have leptomorph monopo mo monopodial rhizomes. Leptomorph means uh, a running rhizome, uh, whereas the contrasting feature of leptomorph rhizome is the pachymorph rhizome, where they have clumping uh, type. Uh, and also these are uh, tetraploids. They have bicipedal vegetative branch development, which means their branching start at the base and then uh, grow towards the tip. Uh, and also there are lots of molecular evidence to support that this is uh, this group is a monophyletic group. Then um, a little bit about the distribution of the temperate clade. If you take um, Arundinaria, I mean the genus Arundinaria in a strict sense, meaning if you consider, um, so Arundinaria um, at some point there were many species included in this genus Arundinaria. However, recent studies found that there's only three species that belongs to genus Arundinaria. 
uh, those are distributed in Eastern North America. So those are Arundinaria gigantea, Arundinaria tecta, and Arundinaria appalachiana. Everything else, those were uh, considered as Arund uh, Arundinaria uh, needed to be revisited. So there are about 20 species, um, you know, distributed in Central Africa, uh, Central and South Africa, Madagascar, South India, and Sri Lanka. Uh, and then also there are about 560 species distributed in China uh, around that region and then also in Japan. So that's kind of the bigger distribution of the temperate clade. Um, so I think uh, that gives, that is the answer for your question, Rovini. Uh, yes, thank you for that uh, informative and very interesting introduction, Mara. So, uh, so you told that your focus uh, for your PhD was about Sri Lankan temperate bamboos. So we would like to know what, what was it like, what was the study that you conducted for your PhD and what were your findings? Okay. Yes. So, um, so before I go into detail uh, about my findings and my research, I had this bigger question when I started my PhD work. Why is it important to study phylogeny? Um, what, why do we need to understand and history, uh, evolutionary history of a species? So I think uh, many of the biologists would agree with me that understanding the phylogeny or the history of an animal or a species, uh, a plant in general, should be the fund uh, foundation for many other applied sciences. Let's say um, understanding the evolutionary history can give you uh, lots of meaningful insight into that uh, species evolution. Understanding a sequence evolution, understanding a gene, uh, how gene evolved or a protein evolved can uh, be applied in therapeutics and sometimes in vaccine development. And also uh, if you know uh, the physio especially in physiology, if you know the biosynthesis pathway by understanding the phylogeny of a gene or a species, that could be applied in um, uh, sometimes in um, genetically modified species. So even though phylogeny is not appreciated as much like the other applied sciences, I think it should be the foundation for many of these uh, other applied sciences. So that is why it is important to understand the evolutionary history of a species. Um, then when I started my uh, work, I had two broader questions. First one was, uh, what is the phylogenetic position of the Sri Lankan and South Indian temperate woody bamboo species? Around the time that I started my work, uh, we never had um, anybody did any molecular phylogenetic work on these species. So we had a uh, Soderstrom and Ellis uh, published 1988 work. Those were mostly morphology, that is uh, for the flora of Ceylon project. Uh, we had that work done, but that is basically mo mostly based on morphology and also anatomy. So there were no studies done um, anything related to molecular phylogenetics. So that was my first question. And then also I wanted to understand what is the phylogenetic relationship within Arundinaria clades? That means what are the relationships of the, uh, the clades within Arundinaria to each other? So those were two questions that I was trying to understand uh, when I started my work. Then uh, at the time, as I said, uh, there were 11 clades recognized uh, within the temperate clade based on all these uh, different studies that I mentioned here. However, uh, the relationship were not uh, resolved. So there's a big, huge polytomy here and uh, none of these uh, you know, relationships were understood uh, at that time. So that was uh, one of, you know, that was my second question that I was trying to understand. So what I did was, uh, this is about um, 10 years now, uh, 10 years ago, I did uh, lots of field work in Sri Lanka. I was able to collect all the species. Uh, those were reported based on herbarium specimens. So what I did was I went through all the herbarium specimens. I collected all the information, location information, and then I went to all these different places to find out uh, these different um, 
Arundinaria populations in Sri Lanka, but I was not able to collect any anything from India. Then um, I did lots of molecular work. So I started with uh, five uh, chloroplast regions um, to begin uh, my phylogenetic studies. So this is just to show you um, the extent of the Arundinaria populations in Horton Plains. I'm sure for many of you, this is not an unusual site. You've seen this before, but uh, if I were to show this, uh, do this presentation to someone here, I usually show this to uh, tell them uh, the extent of the population around Dinaria. This is actually what used to be called around Dinaria densifolia in the Horton Plains. Um, and also this is the map of Horton Plains. All these red uh, patches are the dense Arundinaria densifolia um, uh, right here. And they are usually along the streamlines here. So this is uh, my first finding. Um, so I was able to, as I said, I collected all the species from Sri Lanka and I was able to include those sequences in a um, molecular phylogeny. And this is what I found out. So I was so excited when I see this result, uh, my first um, question was answered. The Sri Lankan species, they form its own clade with lots of support from maximum parsimony, maximum likelihood and Bayesian inference. So, um, so then uh, we've decided uh, we are gonna recognize this as a new genus and we named it as Kuruna. The reason that we used the name Kuruna was uh, I use the name Kuruuna and I Latinize it to Kuruna. Uh, these were commonly known as Kuru butter. Uh, however, uh, it was hard for me to uh, Latinize the word butter, so I had to use a different name. So I decided to use uh, Kuruuna instead. So that's how the Kuruna name um, came to be. Then um, it is it is nice to have molecular evidence to support. Uh, uh, the genus, but uh, I believe, I strongly believe that if you don't see any morphological evidences, uh, just by based on uh, molecular evidence, it is hard to recognize a genus. So if you are somebody who wanted to go outside and, you know, into the field and then collect some of these species, you need to have some morphological evidences, some solid things that you can see uh, and recognize them as a new genus. So luckily, we were able to find some um, morphological evidences that separates uh, the Sri Lankan Arundinaria species uh, from the Arundinaria sensus stricto group. Those are the ones that we find here in the United States, eastern parts of the United States. So our Sri Lankan Arundinaria, um, they have uh, pachymorph rhizomes. So these are the clumping type that I mentioned earlier. Whereas the common type uh, is uh, the leptom of rhizomes, that's the running rhizome type. And also, uh, if you look at the calm leaves of the Sri Lankan species, they are mostly scabrous, whereas the calm leaves of Arundinaria sensu stricto, they are mostly glabrous. And if you look at the stigmas, uh, Sri Lankan species have two stigmas, and the Arundinaria sensu stricto uh, species have three stigmas. So these are uh, very basic but um, unique features of the Sri Lankan species, Sri Lankan and also South Indian species. Uh, those are unique to uh, that genus. So, so Kuruna can be recognized as a new genus based on these morphological uh, evidences and then also molecular evidences. Then from my first um, uh, phylogenetic tree, I was still not able to uh, understand uh, what's happening here. So the, my first question was answered, but my second question, what were the relationship among these clades? They were not resolved. So then I decided um, I will include um, more uh, sequences. What I did was uh, I've used, instead of using uh, smaller pieces of sequences, then I decided to use uh, the entire plastome. So I did um, downloaded 17 plastome from the GenBank and 11 new plastomes were sequences. Uh, I, I did 11 uh, new plastomes. And again, I did maximum parsimony likelihood and Bayesian inference uh, analysis uh, to figure out what's happening here. 
So what I found was, uh, again, all the 11 clades plus the corona clade were resolved uh, based on the plastum sequences as well. However, um, still we are not certain about what's happening here with, you know, with regard to the different clades within, what's the relationship within um, the clades. Then, um, so after that, I decided, okay, so I've used a few pieces of sequences from plastome, and then I used the entire uh, sequences of the plastomes. Still, I couldn't get the resolution that I needed. And, and many of you might know that plastomes tell you a one part of the story because it has a maternal inheritance. Um, so I decided, what if I use nuclear markers? that will tell us a different story. So I decided to use uh, some low copy nuclear markers. Uh, before I show my results of low copy nuclear markers, I wanted to briefly tell you about this study that was done by Triplet et al in 2014. This is a study uh, that they based on AFLP markers. Again, they are nuclear markers. And what they found was, uh, there are several different genomes within uh, Arundinaria. So for Arundinaria, I mean, bam Bambusoidea in general, within Arundinaria, there are two genomes, A and B, uh, and Bambusia, uh, there are tetraploids and then also hexaploids. So if it's uh, allotetraploids, they found C and D genome. Uh, and then uh, for some hexaploids, they found C, D and E genome. And for Olyria, they also found diploids. And then also if it's an auto tetraploid, uh, it's an H genome. So uh, there's, a, uh, the hidden, there's a hidden uh, story uh, that you that revealed from a FLP study. So then I've used this as my base uh, for my nuclear marker studies. And what I found was, uh, so PV cell one, PABP1 and RPB21, RPB2, are um, low copy nuclear markers. Based on my study, I've also uh, found that there's a B copy and an A copy uh, in these um, markers as well. However, this is only maximum parsimony. Uh, when I uh, combine all my studies, um, when I combine all my studies, what I found was, uh, again, less support here. Um, I couldn't resolve all of the um, uh, relationships that I wanted, but uh, I was able to get all the 12 clades within Arundinaria with uh, lots of support. And few mm -hmm. other things that I wanted to mention here is that uh, I had a few discrepancies. Uh, so if you look at Fergasia here, uh, it should be a cluster, uh, Fergasia and Eushania, they need to be, they should be uh, clustered with Philostachis. However, um, I find them in several different uh, places in the phylogeny. And also uh, Ferrocalamus uh, should be with uh, Shibario clade, but uh, it is uh, by itself here. And, and same, same with SARS, SARS, SARS species here. They should be with Shibario clade, but they, uh, come off as its own clade. So uh, some of the reasons that uh, these are happening uh, could be due to long branch attraction and there could be some hybridization happening here, reticulate evolution. Um, with the information that I had here, I was not able to uh, confidently uh, tell uh, you all, tell, uh, tell that um, this is the reason that this is happening. But um, this is something for future if somebody wanted to take from here and then include more nuclear markers. And now that the sequencing cost is getting cheaper and cheaper every day, I think people can do lots of, uh, you know, even the entire, um, you know, nuclear sequence and then figure out what's happening in some of these uh, clades as well. Then uh, a comparison of a plastum phylogeny with the low copy nuclear phylogeny. Uh, the, the big thing is that we bo uh, both um, nuclear phylogeny and then also the uh, plastum phylogeny, uh, they revealed the same story, uh, meaning uh, they showed us all the 12 clades. However, um, unlike in the plastum sequence phylogeny, in the low copy nuclear uh, phylogeny, 
the coronaclade uh, came as the early diverging lineage uh, of the Arundinaria uh, clade. So this is still at uh, initial stage. So we don't know what is which what is this true story here, but there are some uh, evidence to support that. There is something going on here, but we don't have enough evidence to support it. Then uh, the conclusion of my, the first part of my study, uh, as I mentioned earlier, my questions were, uh, what is the phylogenetic position of the Sri Lankan and South Indian temperate woody bamboos? Um, I think I was able to figure out that it's a new uh, mage lineage. It's the 12th lineage. Um, and then uh, we recognize that as, that as a new genus, uh, genus Kuruna. Uh, most of the previously identified major clades were supported by both plastome and locopinuclear marker data sets. Uh, and then um, plastome data also revealed all the 12 major clades within Arundinaria. Uh, and locopinuclear markers, uh, they revealed that clade 12, which is the corona clade, as the early diverging lineage of Arundinaria. So these are uh, kind of the major findings that from my first uh, set of phylogenetic analysis. Then moving on to the second part of my work, my research was now that I found that this group is a new genus, uh, I had to do a taxonomic revision. So uh, my objectives were, I wanted to describe the diversity of the corona species, um, and I wanted to identify an identification. I wanted to create an identification key. And also, um, I also wanted to perform a preliminary assessment of the conservation status of these species. I just wanted to show you here some of the pictures of these species. Both uh, Corona floribanda and Corona debilis, what mm, used to be called as Arundinaria floribanda and Arundinaria debilis, uh, uh, relatively they you can find them in a lower elevation compared to the other species, um, and they uh, look very similar. Um, I, sometimes you'll see this uh, markings on the stem of floribanda, whereas in debilis you don't see that. And also, if you look at the leaves, um, they floribunda, they have a broader leaf compared to, to debilis. And also both these species, you can find them as uh, in understory of forests. Uh, whereas Volcariana and Scandens, um, unfortunately, when I was uh, collecting these species, even though uh, the herbarium specimens, those uh, some dated back to 1920s, 1930s, they had locations, a lot of locations, but when I went to those places, I couldn't find those populations anymore. So for Corona uh, Volcariana, the only population that I found was uh, in Adams Peak. And then for Corona uh, Scandens, the only population that I found was in uh, on top of uh, Mount Pidruta Lagala. Um, then uh, for Corona uh, Densifolia, uh, this is the species that you see in Horton Plains everywhere. Um, even though um, I will talk about this in, uh, in my population genetics uh, section, but even though you see this uh, in, a, in a huge um, areas, uh, their genetic diversity is really um, a low because it is, it is starting from, a, a, you know, from the same clump. So, um, even though you see uh, them as uh, you know a big clump, they all start from uh, the same um, rhizome. So, the if something happens to the Holden Plains uh, Holden Plains densifolia, there's uh, no more. So that's my point here. Um, and then also I wanted to show you this just to um, illustrate here that. Um, so when I was collecting these species, I thought uh, these are actually grasses. Um, but then uh, when you look at them closer, uh, uh, I saw that this is uh, this you know ball type of structure here is uh, due to uh, deer grazing. This is also densifolia, but because of uh, the you know grazing of deers, they have this ball shaped structure, but they are all densifolia. Uh, so I thought it's uh, interesting. 
Then we also found a new species and uh, we named it as uh, Corona cellulara. Uh, the reason is because of these uh, cellulated leaf uh, margins. And also another unique feature of this species is that they have a solid um, columns. Usually um, um, the usually the temperate woody bamboos in Sri Lanka, they have a hollow cones, but in this case for cellulara, they have um, solid cones. So these are two unique features of this species and we recognize that as a corona cellulara. Then based on herbarium specimens, um, we've also revised uh, Arundinaria vaidiana into corona vaidiana. And this is solely based on herbarium specimens. However, they have uh, lots of unique features that uh, compares with the Sri Lankan uh, corona clade um, compared to the Arundinaria sensus stricto. You know, so they have pacum of rhizomes, they have hispid palm leaves, and then also um, oracles usually absent, and all these other features. Um, cluster them with the Sri Lankan corona clade um, compared to the Arundinaria sensus stricto. And then uh, I've also, as I mentioned, I performed a um, study to recognize, uh, to categorize these uh, species into, into IUCN red list. Um, as I'm showing here, all these red font uh, are um, characterized as critically endangered, mainly because uh, there are very few populations that you can find here in uh, Sri Lanka. Um, so, um, Corona densifolia you can find only in Horton Plains. Uh, Corona floribunda, I found few populations. Uh, Corona scandens, as I said, um, were found only on Mount Pidurthalagala. Unfortunately, even when I was collecting these species, uh, they were highly threatened. I can see that uh, they were mostly uh, removed from most of the parts uh, where they naturally occur. And people sometimes they don't even recognize this is a grass, I mean, a bamboo. Um, I remember one time one person told me that they are so annoying, so I just cut them because these are just grasses. So they don't even know that these are bamboos. Um, so I had to tell them that these are not grasses and these are actually bamboos. Um, and Volcariana, again, we found only in um, um, Adam Speak, we didn't find Volcariana population anywhere else. So for Vaidiana, I didn't have enough information since I have not collected them from India. Uh, I said data deficient. Uh, my observations were solely based on herbarium specimens. So I don't know uh, the situation of uh, Vaidiana in India. But um, just looking at all these species in Sri Lanka, um, even Cerulara and Corona debilis, we find some populations, but I think uh, with um, deforestation, um, global warming, and then and, and sometimes you know just um, pure ignorance uh, makes these species disappear uh, from the world forever. So um, this is again um, about these findings were. Uh, based on the collections um, that I did 10 years ago. And unfortunately, I don't know the status of these species now. Then uh, just to conclude uh, the taxonomic findings here, I found seven corona species I've described and illustrated. Uh, then um, Floribunda and Volcariana, uh, when I looked at um, I have not looked at uh, herbarium specimens, but this is based on some of the reports. Uh, they mentioned that uh, Floribanda and Volcariana are also uh, found in India, but I have not seen any of the herbarium specimens. Um, then uh, of the seven species, uh, based on my observations, uh, I recognize four species as critically endangered, two as endangered. Um, of this uh, corona uh, species. And also um, all of you know that uh, Western Ghats of India and Sri Lanka are biodiversity hotspots. So if you were to um, dig into deeper to these uh, conservation statuses of these species, 
I think we have to um, collect some species from India and look at these populations and then see um, what's uh, going on. And then also we can figure out if, we, if there are any Floribanda or Volcariana populations in India as well. So that's uh, so that is uh, so far. I've discussed my phylogenetic studies and then my taxonomy. And then when I was uh, doing um, my work, I wanted to develop an interactive key, uh, a web-based interactive key. So um, I've started uh, looking for um, softwares or programs that can develop a, a web-based interactive key the way that I wanted, but. Um, I, I couldn't I couldn't find a program that um, helped me with that. So I've decided to make my own. So what uh, we did was um, we developed our own program uh, that can uh, build uh, your own web-based interactive key. So we named it as Web WebIKey. All you have to do is download this program and install it on your computer um, and um, you know what with a um, few setting uh, setting up uh, databases and things like that uh, you can upload your own images you can upload your own uh, descriptions and things of that nature and you can make your own um, uh, web-based interactive key so this, uh, so after I had that program built, I used uh, that uh, to develop my own uh, web-based interactive key. So I used that for the uh, Sri Lankan Corona clade. Um, so it has a homepage, and then once you uh, go to the interactive key tab, it'll tell you all the features of the, you know, all the features of Bambusoidea. Then depending on what you have in your hand, you can pick the features that you want. And here in the selected species and then eliminated species based on the features that you uh, select here, uh, it'll separate into selected and then eliminated species. So at the end, once you are done with the selections, you will end up in one, uh, end up here with one name, which is your uh, species that you have in your hand. So that's how this interactive key work. Uh, and also I had few other things included here as, um, you know, I've included a dichotomous key. People can look at the dichotomous key if they wanted to. And also if you go to the species info uh, tab, you can uh, find all the species information. You can have a PDF um, uploaded as species information. And um, as I said, uh, unfortunately this uh, page uh, I recently um, discovered that some of these pages are not working because uh, at the time that I uh, did this, um, this uh, I had a server that I can have everything uh, on that server. However, after I graduated, um, there were some modifications done and I don't have access to those servers anymore. So I can't do anything to my uh, website here, but uh, all the, um, the software or the program, uh, um, uh, the program files that you need to develop your own key. I have it on a GitHub, so you can you know download whatever the files that you need, and you can develop your own key. But you, this is an example key that I developed, but I don't think people can look at it now, even though you can go to the home page. Then the last part of. Yeah, this is the home page that I was. Let me, yeah. Um, then, so the last part of my um, work, my PhD work, was doing some population genetic works uh, for uh, Corona debilis um, populations because Corona debilis were the, was the only uh, species that I had uh, many populations from many different locations, so. Um, I've collected 28 individuals uh, uh, from six different geographical locations. Um, at the, uh, so just by looking at this number, you can see that I have low sample size uh, due to these um, reasons. They, have, they are small population itself. And also there were few genetically distinct individuals and there, I had collection difficulties as well. Um, However, even though uh, these were low uh, sample sizes, um, there were um, 
some promising results that I uh, got from this study. I've used 12 uh, microsatellite markers for this uh, population genetic study. Um, I found for many uh, loci, uh, there were huge, um, there were huge allelic diversity, and also given the close uh, proximity. Given the close proximity, uh, I also uh, found that there's a huge genetic diversity um, here in these populations as well. So when I did FST values. Uh, they were close to 0.113. Then I also did uh, some other analysis like structure analysis, neighbor joining, neighbor net, and mental test. What I found was uh, the six population were clustered into three major groups. This is consistent with uh, their geographical location as well. Um, so the Western group uh, is just the population from Adams Peak. Um, the population from Handapang Ala Plains uh, Mountain, uh, they were clustered as my southern group, and also uh, the population from Pidru Talagala and uh, Adams Peak, they clustered into one group. Um, so um, these were, uh, you know, from all these studies that was uh, consistent. Um, and then I also did um, MOVA test uh, to. Um, understand the genetic um, diversity or differentiation uh, within the clusters and then among clusters. What I found was um, among clusters, uh, among clusters, variance was about 8%. Whereas within cluster, among population within cluster uh, variance was about 7.5%. And the remaining 84% was within populations. And then also my phi SC and phi CT um, are the genetic differentiation among subpopulation within a genetic cluster, and also genetic differentiation among genetic clusters relative to the total population. They were significant and they were significantly different from zero. Um, so those were some um, alarming findings that I uh, found from this uh, analysis. So to summarize my population genetics study, uh, given the limited distance separating these populations, uh, of all these six populations, they were either 65 kilometers apart or uh, less. And as I said, they um, exhibited fairly high genetic differentiation and also uh, strong isolation by distance. So if we were to um, conserve some of these populations, let's say you are making decisions whether to pick one population or the other uh, for conservation purposes. I would say uh, Northern uh, Horton Plains population should be targeted uh, this is because of its high allelic diversity. Um, and then again, the population in Adams Peak, uh, it, it has its unique genetic diversity. So in a conservation um, effort, this population should also be um, conserved or targeted um, in conservation efforts. Then, um, as I mentioned earlier, all these different analysis that I did clustered uh, my six uh, Corona Depolis populations into three genetic clusters. And that was consistent with the spatial proximity as well, uh, meaning uh, the Handapang and Plain uh, populations, they all cluster into one group. And uh, the Adams Peak and Pedro Talagal Mountain populations clustered into another. Uh, and then uh, this other population was by itself. So um, those are the Horton Plains ones. Um, that is consistent with the spatial proximity of the populations. Um, so um, all these work that I discussed today, they were all uh, already being published. So um, if you need any of these uh, papers, please reach out to me. Uh, I think some of these are not open access. So if you need these papers, let me know. Um, I think with that, uh, this is, I have not uh, explained you all the details I've done. So uh, much more uh, analysis wise, um, like hypothesis testing and things of that nature that I'm not showing here. And I've also done lots of uh, uh, morphological uh, evolution studies uh, in these papers. So uh, 
Um, I have not shown them here, but I'm just uh, I've just discussed the very basic um, findings. But there are lots of inf more information if you read these papers. So uh, feel free to write to me, and I I will be able to give you these papers if you need these. Um, so we need that concludes my second part of the talk. Uh, thank you, Madam. That was really inspiring. So uh, fi my final question would be. What are the current researchers that you are involved with? And uh, what would be the opportunities that we would have uh, in the future? Yes. So um, after I uh, graduated, after I finished my PhD and I did my postdoc, I joined a lab uh, where they did lots of corn research, um, even though corn and bamboos are in the same uh, family. Uh, they are drastically different. Um, here, the corn here in the United States um, is a, is really important in, uh, in an economical sense. Um, the state that I live in, Iowa, it is the number one state that produces uh, more corn. So uh, we are here surrounded by um, thousands of acres of corn and everywhere you go, you see corn fields and sometimes soybean fields. So um, corn plays a huge uh, economic role here in Iowa. So uh, people um, pay more attention uh, to corn here. So, um, some of the so I'm today I'm going to discuss um, very uh, briefly two research um, projects that I've involved with. The main reason that I wanted to talk to you about is uh, to uh, tell all these young people who join here today uh, the collaborative nature of research. So the first one that I'm going to talk um, about today is. Uh, this nitrogen sensor that we've uh, de developed with uh, the collaboration uh, of some of our engineering colleagues. Um, so nitrogen, as many of you know, sufficient nitrogen is essential for high uh, crop yield. Um, here in the United States, uh, nitrogen is the second most expensive input uh, that we apply, that we apply to uh, corn, uh, rain-fed corn, that is after seeds. So um, let's say uh, because of annual variation in the soil nitrogen um, due to carbonic matter, and then also um, the loss of nitrogen from the soil, it is so hard to predict the optimum level of nitrogen that we need to apply, that we meaning the farmers needs to apply uh, to soil to gain uh, optimum yield. So if you, if you apply more nitrogen, you are wasting your time, your money, um, and then also there are lots of negative consequences on environment. Whereas if you apply less nitrogen, um, you are losing um, your yield. So uh, the point here is, it is we need to find the balance. You um, you know where this. Uh, if you apply more, it's bad. If you apply less, it's bad. But we need to find this sweet spot. Where it, is, um, where it is the right amount. But um, so to do that, farmers need to uh, find out what's the optimum level of nitrogen in the soil or in the plant. So what farmers do right now is before we have this nitrogen sensor, what farmers did was they, uh, they collect their samples, soil samples, and they send it to a lab. And usually um, they take about a week to get their results back. So what they are getting as their nitrogen reading is what they had a week ago. So it's not uh, real time. So, um, so let's say between the time that you send the samples to the lab and then the time that you receive the samples, if there's a huge rain, storm, um, the soil nitrogen changed. And if there's a huge drought, again, the soil nitrogen has changed. So it's not the real time reading that you get from those testing. So some of our colleagues here at Iowa State, what they decided was um, they, they decided to design a micro scale sharp needle that can be inserted into plant tissue. This is more like a smart device for um, nitrogen sensing. All you have to do is just in, uh, insert the needle into the plant and it'll give you a, a nitrate reading. Even though it is uh, in a sense, it's very simple, but there's uh, lots of uh, 
biochemical um, mechanisms happening here. You need to have a special membrane that can uh, identify only nitrate uh, without interfering with these other ions. So Dr. Leon Dong here at Iowa State uh, was the leading scientist who led um, this um, huge endeavor, but as biologists to agronomists in our lab, what we did was um, we were the one who actually tested these um, sensors. So I've been involved with uh, this project for several years now. So every year, uh, based on our input and then also based on farmers input, they uh, they develop their sensor, you know, they modify their sensor and they give us another version and you know, next year and we test that sensor again and we give the pros and cons and based on that they uh, change their design sometimes. So that's how the process is happening and we've been testing this um, sensor for several years now. So this graph shows you um, how uh, the sensor readings is uh, comparable to the conventional method. Conventional method, meaning um, this is a spectrophotometric method. What you do is you cut the plant and you take the juice out of the plant, you mean the sap, and, the, and then you measure that in a spectrophotometer. Um, whereas the sensor, it is not a destructive method. All you have to do is here, um, insert the needle into the plant and it'll give you a reading. So you see here that there's a huge, uh, a good correlation here uh, between the conventional method and the uh, sensor uh, readings. And also um, this is what you uh, can see here um, commercially available. Um, again, this is a destructive method uh, in this, uh, for this, um, if you open this lid here, you can add your sample that is the sample that once you have once you cut your plant you squeeze the juice from the plant and you put it here into this um you know this uh, window here and it'll give you a reading whereas our method again you don't have to do uh, any uh, you don't have to cut your plant it'll tell you the reading right away uh, sometimes you can have your readings uh, you know on your smartphone and and sometimes uh, you can upload your data into the cloud so and, and also uh, we've tested this uh, in different um, solutions like interfering ions um, so um, there is a, a you know a reading variation but it's not a huge variation if you just look at, um, you know, in naturally in plants, it's not just nitrate uh, in uh, phloem or, or xylem. Uh, there are so many other ions that uh, you will find. So what we wanted to figure out was, um, can this uh, uh, device uh, recognize uh, only nitrate without interfering with other ions? And I think we have promising results. Again, as I said, every year they modified their design based on some of our um, observations. So the main reason that I wanted to um, tell you this um, part of my research was to um, tell all these young people who uh, joined us today to tell um, the collaborative nature of this research. So here in, in this team, we had engineers, we had farmers, we had biologists, we had agronomists, we all uh, worked at, as a team. And then also, um, so, so I did my PhD in phylogenetics, but that doesn't mean I, uh, I have to work uh, my entire life in phylogenetics. So I, I switched my gear and I moved to a different area, but still the things that I learned from my PhD, I was able to apply some of my stuff into these um, analysis and studies as well. Uh, so the advice here is, uh, even though you do plant sciences, biotechnology, bioinformatics, just, uh, you know, basic uh, uh, sciences, uh, you can uh, broaden your horizon once you, um, once you do your higher studies. Uh, not like my times or even uh, my before my time, not just uh, there. Now there are so many different areas that you can um, apply your knowledge. So uh, these are some of the trending uh, research that you can find here in the United States in the agricultural field. And then also uh, there are other uh, precision agricultural applications that 
uh, we do here and we get lots of funding and lots of opportunities are here. So I encourage uh, you all to apply for areas. Those are um, trending and then also those are uh, important um, and I have lots of um, applied um, you know, applications. Um, so that's that's one of the reasons that I wanted to discuss this project with you all today. Um, and also a uh, last one that I wanted to um, show you here is another project that I'm involved with. Um, so this is uh, about shoot apical meristem, uh, which gives rise to all the above ground parts. And many uh, scientists in my group, we are interested in SAM because it will tell us a lot. So understanding the genetics behind SAM can tell us a big story and it could be applied in many different uh, prediction models. And, and sometimes um, understanding SAM can tell us a lot of um, other features like yield and leaf angles and things of that nature. So when we were doing this um, study, uh, we uh, came, um, we came to a, a bottleneck where we couldn't go beyond that because of a because of some uh, difficulties that we had. So we had uh, taken about three, uh, I think, about three thousand uh, images of these SAM uh, tissues. However, uh, we wanted to get uh, the width and the height of SAM, um, even though you know um, there could be a human involvement, and we can do one by one uh, height and width and it's going to introduce more errors and it's time consuming so again we talked to some of our engineers and what they did was uh, they helped us with um, you know some of very basic uh, algorithms uh, and then we were able to get the height and width and we were able to do uh, further downstream analysis with those as well. So again, a teamwork, um, collaborative research. We work with lots of engineers, um, sometimes with uh, mathematicians, phys uh, physics uh, people, and also um, we are working with lots of statisticians. Um, that's how um, lots of these research are done uh, these days. So that's what I wanted to emphasize here with this. Um, this part of uh, my research as well. I'm not showing you all the stuff that I'm doing, but um, many of these research involvements uh, that I am uh, doing are mostly uh, using lots of technology and then also uh, lots of collaborative uh, teamwork. Uh, with that, I would like to uh, thank my two labs, Clark Lab and also Schnabel Lab, um, and also, um, all these, my, my PhD work, uh, they were, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm so thankful for all these agencies who helped me with the permits, uh, Forest Department of Sri Lanka, Department of Wildlife Conservation, and also Sri Lankan Customs. They helped me a lot uh, to get the correct permits that I needed and also um, get the stuff uh, here to United States. So I'm so grateful for these uh, agencies as well. And also, um, thank you, WhatsApp, for inviting me. And uh, um, it's been a pleasure. And, and one last thing that I wanted to, um, one last slide. Um, as Uvini said, I am the academic advisor for Sri Lankan Student Association. So uh, when people um, apply here, um, if they have questions, usually they contact their friends here. Sometimes if they don't have friends, they contact me. Uh, so feel free to reach out to me if you have questions. Sometimes uh, people, uh, even before they apply uh, to Iowa State, if they have questions like what type of programs are here, what type of um, research um, you know, professors uh, are doing what type of research and things of that nature, if you have questions, uh, reach out to me and I should be able to help you. Um, and then also one last thing is that I am also involved in an association called Feel Lanka. Uh, this is an alumni association of uh, University of Colombo Science Faculty. Um, the reason that I have it here is I think some of you fi may find the, uh, some of these uh, things interesting. They have a YouTube channel called uh, Feel TV, um, and um, they do some uh, meaningful. Um, good things for Sri Lankan education system. So um, reach out to them if you like. Uh, they do um, have internships and volunteering work if you like to work with them. 
Um, yeah, so uh, with that, I would like to take any questions if you have. Uh, and also this is my email address if you want to reach me. Thank you, Dr. Adigala, for that interesting and very informative presentation. So now uh, it's time for your questions. The audience can uh, unmute themselves and direct their questions to Dr. Adigala. Um, hello, Lakshmi. I'm Shamala here. Uh, I thought I will call you first and because I need to go out now. Um, very nice to see you. Um, um, I'm certainly interested in your night nitrogen probe nitrate probe okay so i will i will i will contact you about that um again it's very good to see you thank you and yes i'm so great to hear your voice and i'm, I'm glad to uh, help if you have any questions and yeah we can talk hello lakshmi uh, it's very happy to see you and uh, Happy to see all your good work. And uh, Lakshmi, I think it's a very good uh, lesson for all the plant science and other undergraduates because it's a very comprehensive work. You started with the tax, also phylogenetics, taxonomy, and also you combine the, uh, your computational ability. Always you had that when you were doing the undergraduate work also. So databases and working with other softwares and so on. So it's like uh, then finally the population genetics and also uh, everything together. It's a, a nice combination and a very, I mean, uh, the multidisciplinary research. So combining molecular phylogenetics systematics together with the, uh, I mean, the analysis and everything. I think most of the things for the years and uh, for them, I think we have taught you the analysis part. They have not maybe fully understood, but uh, you should at least heard these words and how you can, uh, what you are learning here now, even you can apply those things in future for your postgraduate work. So actually, I'm very proud of you, Lakshmi, because you started as an undergraduate student and uh, and always you was interested in field work and it's uh, nice to work with you as a collaborator for your, I mean, the PhD work. And I'm uh, very happy uh, that you are doing very well today. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Madam. Yes, I mean, uh, as I said earlier, the foundation for all my research, I had it from uh, plant sciences uh, department. So I'm so thankful for all my mentors here um, to giving me that opportunity to start uh, from the, from, you know, I had a good foundation or uh, uh, I, I think I had a good foundation. So I'm so thankful for all of you, madam. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Uh, Dr. Artigal, thank you very much for that uh, wonderful talk. I have a question uh, about your phylogenetic analysis. At the end, you said uh, uh, that there, at the end, you said that uh, there were some clades that required uh, further enhancement of resolution. Uh, can you recommend uh, what can be done if others are faced with that kind of situation? I mean, increasing the number of molecular markers which work or are there any uh, like uh, field standards that you can take? Yes, so I think that's a really great question. Um, so there are a few things that you can we can do. So one thing, as you said, we can increase the number of taxa. Uh, and also, uh, again, there's a trade-off. So uh, depending on the resources that you have, sometimes even with fewer number of samples, if you can do, uh, let's say, a complete a sequence of a genome, if you can use uh, genome sequencing, um, you can use that as your, um, you can increase the level of uh, your sequence depth, but you can use a fewer number of samples. 
or you can have more samples, but then in that case, you have to cut down your markers. Um, again, as I said, uh, sequencing uh, technologies are getting cheaper and cheaper every day now. So uh, if you can have your maximum number of taxa and then ma maximum number of uh, markers, that is uh, ideal. Uh, but if you can't, then you have to do that trade-off um, depending on what type of questions that you are trying to understand, um, I think. Okay, uh, thank you uh, for, the, for that. Uh, one more additional question. Is the genome for the bamboo, is that sequenced or the whole genome or are there any, I'm is there a project? No, so unfortunately, I don't think, um, as to my knowledge, we don't have the genome sequence yet. Because the main reason is, um, so these are not model species. So it is so hard to get funding for these type of research, because as I said, these are um, basic research. Uh, if it's a model species like Arabidopsis or corn or rice, we get lots of funding and we can do lots of uh, genome sequencing, but for bamboos, uh, I don't think we have the genome sequence yet. Okay, thank you very much. Once again, thank you for your wonderful talk. Uh, Lakshmi, again, uh, one research question from uh, me again. Uh, you have done the, uh, uh, the low copy nuclear genes as well as the plastic, uh, whole plastic genome. So the resolution, what do you can really uh, talk about? I mean, uh, about the low cop resolution of the low copy nuclear markers? Yes. So, uh, Madam, I think for the low copy nuclear markers, uh, we didn't get uh, enough resolution. I think it's because the markers that we choose, they were not good enough. And there were few... Uh, research on this uh, topic. So we were not able to uh, figure out what are the best low copy nuclear markers. But I think um, if you look at some of the rice research and then some of these other, um, other um, bamboo related or grass related research, uh, we can uh, find more uh, low copy nuclear markers. And I think with that knowledge, uh, if we can include more markers, we should be able to uh, get more resolution. However, as I said, uh, there are lots of complex relationships going on that we can't uh, resolve everything. Uh, so if we can have uh, many different markers, uh, maybe some AFLP markers, some SNP, uh, SNPs, uh, maybe we should be able to um, figure it out. But um, yeah, we have not done that yet. Any evidences for hybridization uh, like things in natural populations? Uh, in natural populations, we have not seen uh, with the corona clade. However, uh, we have evidence in, um, Ar in Arundinaria, I think Appalachia and Tecta in Arundinaria sensu stricto clade. And also uh, some of the Shibatia uh, species, we see hybridization happening and we can actually see them in nature. So we have evidence to support that from that triplet et al 2014 paper. But not within the Kruna clade. No, not yet. Okay. I mean, I have not seen them and I don't think we have seen that yet. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. I am Marit from the third year undergraduate student from Plant Science Special Degree. Um, I want to know about the, are there any literature or research about thing, the corona species in uh, South Indian, the Western Ghats one? Are there so, any research? Uh, yes. So um, as far as I know, the uh, only corona vitiana, as I said, uh, is the only one that was revised into uh, genus corona. However, there are other species. Um, less molecular studies, but more morphological studies. I've seen some papers uh, that they talk about uh, other Arundinaria species in, um, uh, in India. Uh, I know there are people, uh, I've, I had people contacted me regarding uh, some taxonomic studies that they are doing uh, uh, in, with the 
Indian species, but I have not seen uh, any detailed studies yet. Uh, one more question. Yes, how the panel plane uh, is it located in Sri Lanka? Um, how do I say? Um, unfortunately, I don't. Uh, it is, uh, I think it's close. It is close to uh, the. It, it it is in the in the region where we we find all the other temperate species. But I can't tell you exactly where it is located now. But if you need more information, I can email you the exact location. And also, if you uh, look at my papers, it also has GPS coordinates, so you can also uh, figure out that way as well. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's fine. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, that's me. Hello, yeah. Uh, thank you for the interesting presentation, doctor. I'm just curious to know, what are the processes you had to go through in declaring corona as a new genus? Can you just summarize? So uh, the first thing that you want to do when you recognize a new genus is, um, so you have to follow all the, um, the rules uh, when you are naming a new species. Uh, first, uh, as I said, uh, you can just have molecular evidence. You have to have morphological evidence. Uh, so what we did was since we had a already published work uh, on uh, you know, the, what used to be called around in Sri Lanka, around in Aria, we used that as our basis so we rename uh, everything because uh, Debilis floribunda, Volcariana scandens, and uh, yeah, Densifolia, they were also, they were already being uh, described. So what we had to do was rename them or revise them into Kuruna. Uh, however, since we were the ones uh, that um, recognized this as a new genus, we, uh, we were able to put our... Um, names as the uh, after the species epithet we had our names uh, after the species name then you also need to include um, the descriptions and and uh, the illustrations so illustrations are uh, really important we've used some of the existing illustrations for the ones already described but then for the ones we don't have illustrations we worked with um, um, students here who are in a medical illustration program, um, they, they, uh, they, th that's the program where they teach you how to draw scientific drawings. So they helped us, uh, they actually worked with us as interns, and they are the one who helped us with um, all these um, scientific illustrations. So it's not just um, drawings, but you need to have precision and also we need, you need to have accuracy. So that's how we um, did our illustrations. So once you have your illustrations, once you have your uh, species name uh, decided, um, and all your, because uh, uh, if when you use, um, let's say uh, Linnaeus as an example, take Linnaeus as an example, you can't have, you can't write Linnaeus as Linnaeus. So you have to have a um, author um, name abbreviation. That is uh, for each author, it's unique. Uh, so for me, I think I had my whole name, my whole last name, but thing, I think for Dr. Katyarachi, she need to, um, um, like abbreviate her name. So there are different rules that you need to apply uh, for that as well. So those are some of the steps that you need to do. And also you have to um, publish your work in a peer reviewed journal. And once you have those, all those, um, you know, done, uh, I think you can recognize your new genus or new species as a new species. And the scientific community will recognize that as a new species. Or a genus. Uh, 
Hello, madam. I'm Vidhuni Alvis uh, from the Department of Plant Sciences following special degree in plant biotechnology. Uh, your uh, talk is really interesting. Uh, and I would like to know uh, any uh, special characteristics, uh, characteristics that are uh, specially adapted to the riverine habitats uh, in Adams Peak as well as in Horton Plains that in your study. Uh, do you mean uh, with regard to um, specific species? Well, I, I don't understand the question. Any special characteristics that are specially adapted to the riverine habitats? Okay, so uh, Gensifolia is the species that I found. Those can uh, grow in standing cold water. For those, uh, for Gensifolia, they actually have uh, air canals, uh, if you look at uh, the anatomy. So I think that's a special feature that um, adapt to the like a swampy uh, environment. And uh, that is the only species that I found uh, that can grow with the, with the swampy environments. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Again, Malithia, madam. Uh, I want to know about the, the, the most of them are critically endangered one. No? Uh, are they a result from latest red later list one? No, that now they are changed their conservation status now. So, uh, uh, so these are purely based on my observations. As I said, I don't know if you are, if you look at their UC in red list now if they have this included in their um, analysis. Uh, this is again based on the observations that I did uh, and collections that I did um, 10 years ago. Uh, things might have changed uh, again with deforestation and all these other um, human involvements, global warming. Uh, so I don't know their status now, but I don't, I, and I don't think uh, in their red list, they've included these species yet. Yes, I want to add uh, uh, more to that, Lakshmi, because uh, when you, uh, after you publishing the Corona, only we evaluated in this time, in 2019 red list, I think they have included as Corona. In 2012, I think uh, they were in, not in the new name. So uh, I'm not sure, Malit. Uh, I think anyway, I have the list in 2019. It will be published within two, three months. The finalized, I have to check the status we have given to that. But it's, it has been evaluated nationally because we are doing the national red listing, not the global red listing, but we are recommending names for the global listing. So in, within the Sri Lanka, we assess the species nationally. So nationally, we have the national criteria. So the latest red list will come in two to three months, it's in the printing process. Uh, so that in 2012, you can't find them as Kuruna. So we have assessed them. Uh, this time I can't actually uh, remember the status, but we have assessed them in very latest red list uh, published soon. Okay. Thank you, madam, that's, that's great to hear. Thank you, madam. Excuse me, madam. It's uh, Taruka uh, from third year, plant, uh, bioinformatics special degree. Uh, madam, is there any possibility for the corona species to be present in uh, other regions of the world also? Or is it only in Sri Lanka and India? So uh, based on my, um, my um, results and my observations, um, corona species are only in Sri Lanka and then also in the southern parts of India. Uh, everything else, uh, I mean, uh, the African species, Central African species and Madagascan species. If you, uh, I've seen some of the herbarium specimens and they are uh, unique in some sense. And they also have some common features with the Sri Lankan species. Uh, but I don't think you can find these as uh, uh, another species of Kuruna. So my, uh, my uh, evidence suggests that our Sri Lankan species form its um, own clade. Thank you. 
However, uh, I don't know, maybe if you um, collect some of these African species and do sequencing, uh, story might change, but just purely based on morphology um, of the Central African um, and Madagascan species, I still believe that uh, they should be in their own uh, separate genus, but the Kuruna species from Sri Lanka and South India, they should be in its uh, own clade or own genus. Thank you. I just wanted to thank everybody who uh, asked me questions and these are great questions. And thank you so much for all these questions. Hello, Madam, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, you know, I have a kind of extra question. Uh, would you think that uh, replanting uh, would be successful for the conservation of this uh, species? Or do you have any other suggestions for the conservation for this threatened species? So I think um, for conservation purposes, replanting would be a good start. However, uh, all these species, since these are native species and these are high elevational species, they have their unique um, environments. They have their unique ecosystems. Uh, sometimes, um, you know, uh, if you try to plant these in a somewhere in a low elevation or an area where there's uh, not a favorable condition for these species, you might not be successful. Um, but um, in a conservation effort, I would say um, it is a good start. You know, replanting is a good start. But again, uh, how successful it's going to be, that's something that we need to um, try it out and see. Thank you. Madam. Hello, madam. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, madam. It's uh, really interesting to hear about your studies. Uh, madam, I have a question about a nitrogen sensor. Uh, can we use this nitrogen sensor for different crop plants uh, or is it uh, uh, such as rice and other plants, crop plants? That's a really great question. So I think um, in, in general, this could be applied uh, for any plant. However, um, the nitrogen dynamic, uh, you know, like the dynamics in different plants is different. So what we've tested so far is only for maize. Um, maybe they could be applied to other plants as well uh, with uh, fewer modifications. Um, yes, it's, uh, the technology is simple and it's simple enough. Uh, it could be used in any plant. Uh, as I said, you need to enter, you need to insert the probe into the plant. And then also you should not be able, you can't uh, damage the plant. So there are, uh, some um, limitations, uh, you know, if you use it on rice, I don't know how effective it's going to be. I don't know how it's going to damage the plant. Whereas uh, in corn, it's not a big deal. Um, but I think with some modification, we should be able to use that in nitrogen, uh, in other species as well. Thank you very much, Amanda. Are there any more questions from the audience? I think this time, uh, third year, and them uh, really, I mean, nice to see they are asking good questions. That's yes, also sir. a good trend doing it. Yes, sir. If there are no questions, uh, we can wind up the session.
So as I said, if you have any questions, if you need any papers, need more information regarding anything, please reach out to me. So you all have my email address. So um, I'm happy to help. Uh, seems like there, there are no more questions from the audience. Uh, okay, so with that, uh, let's uh, wind up today's webinar. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to uh, thank Dr. Khatri Araji for sharing the contact details of Dr. Artigala with us, uh, and also Dr. Samir Arivansa, Senior Treasurer for his constant guidance and support, and all the academic staff members of the Department of Plant Sciences, headed by Professor Narayakara, for joining with us today and for constant guidance and encouragement. Uh, and last but not least, all the members and all the members and non-members who participated today, despite being a holiday, and for asking questions enthusiastically. And uh, finally, to Dr. Lakshmi Artigala for joining with us and for your interest in helping us in making today's event successful. Thank you very much for your time and effort, Madam, despite the time difference between the two countries. Thank you once again. And um, thank you, everyone, again. Hope you have a pleasant day. Thank you. Thank you, Vinny, and thank you, Woodsock.